and welcome to Heliotropes. My name is Julia. My name is Kojo. And today we're going to be talking about Black August and the hopes that we can carry these tenants through to every other month since we are now in September. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Black August is a time of resistance, veneration, observation, reflection, study, and it, I mean, ultimately it's, it's August. It's um, Black History Month for revolutionaries, you know, of the African and Afrocentric uh, persuasion. Um, it's a time to reflect and remember those who have fought in the struggle, right? And specifically those who have been imprisoned, political prisoners in America and across the world. Um, and... Yeah, I mean, there's just a lot of things that go into Black August. Um, it's not limited strictly to political prisoners. It's also a time of observation and celebration of the achievements of Marcus Garvey, right? Who um, was born in August and also established the RBG, Red, Black, and Green, um, Black Star Line. You know, he did a lot of his work, uh, major milestones. He hit those in August. James Baldwin was born in August, you know, so right at the beginning, people observe his birthday, and that's part of the, uh, for a lot of people, Black August celebrations. Fela Kuti, Nigerian Afrobeat uh, superstar, and, you know, figure, major figure of uh, resist, resistance against the neocolonial powers in Africa, right? He's Nigerian, but in all of Africa, he was a symbol and a figure he's revered. He was um, he died on August. I think on the same day that uh, his death day is James Baldwin's birthday. And you know, like Fela Kuti was also I think went down in history as the most frequently imprisoned person, right? Um, artist, singer, musician in history because he was so adamant and so vocal speaking out against the system. Uh, advocating for the power that the people can and should have. Um, so that's Black August in a nutshell. I mean, there's a lot more to it, and that's what we're going to go over in the rest of this show. Um, starting with what Julia's got. All right, so I'll share some of the tenets of Black August, including some of what Kojo just mentioned. Um, and I want to start with a quote by Mumia Abu-Jamal, who said, August is a month of meaning, of repression and radical resistance, of injustice and divine justice, of repression and righteous rebellion, of individual and collective efforts to free the slaves and break the chains that bind us. The spirit of Black August moves through centuries of Black, Indian, and multicultural resistance. It is an emblem of the spirit of freedom. And tenants of Black August include fasting from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. or sunrise to sunset as a demonstration of self-discipline, personal commitment, and resistance, breaking the fast with one communal meal um, when that's possible. To abstain from mind-altering substances, including, you know, like alcohol and other drug use. To avoid shopping at corporate stores and to really focus I don't like where we're spending dollars. I actually don't know if we've talked about that in previous podcasts. Um, in terms of like where we choose to spend our money, certainly we've talked about the capitalist system. Um, to avoid television and radio, especially that of like liberal content, and to opt for educational programming such as documentaries, historical writings, and other creative programming. And there's an emphasis on revolutionary study and education, especially of those involved um, in Black August, who Kojo is going to talk about. And it's recommended that participants have a study partner or a group for accountability purposes and for deepening the knowledge. And people can also choose to wear an armband on the left arm or wrist to signify their observation of Black August and solidarity. And I think, you know, like a main difference between or what feels like a main difference between Black August and how Black History Month in February is celebrated is like the actual celebration portion of it and what's included in those 
um, activities, right? So you mentioned celebration, and that's really through like knowledge and learning and a revolutionary focus, whereas Black History Month in the United States is focused much more on um, learning about Black history through the lens of the United States. Um, and these additional celebrations and then, you know, like the Juneteenth celebrations. And those are different than what Black August really calls for. Right. And just, they tend to be, you know, I think like one of the big differences as Julia is hitting on is that um, Black History Month, Juneteenth, they tend to be feel-good celebrations, right? Like, they could be as critical and as um, you know evocative and as crucial of moments of study as Black August is, but they're not because they're nationally observed, right? Because they're increasingly mainstream, if not already mainstream, increasingly in the case of Juneteenth. They're feel-good celebration, right? It's what um, Amos Wilson called it because we go back, we look, and we're like, oh, that history, you know, and, like, the way we celebrate it, oh, look, um, you know, Juneteenth, slave, we're not slaves anymore, or, like, you know, Black History Month, oh, look, you know, this is the first blah, 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 and, right, what that tends to do is say, hey, like, we can achieve these things, but also we can achieve these things within the system that, like, you know, like, so many of the people that we're recognizing, observing, celebrating, we're fighting against. Right, so it becomes a moment of celebrating tokenism, celebrating multiculturalism and diversity and inclusion in the neoliberal sense. Just wanted to throw that out there. Black August is not that. It's a lot more critical. It tends to be observed by people who are a lot more serious actors in the revolutionary uh, struggle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and another observation or way to observe Black August, like a, a crucial part of it that Kojo mentioned before, is to call for the immediate release of all political prisoners and the abolition of prisons. And so I want to share this quote from Angela Davis that provides some insight around political prisoners in this country. There is a distinct and qualitative difference between one breaking a law for one's own individual self-interest and violating it in the interests of a class of people whose oppression is expressed either directly or indirectly through that particular law. The former might be called criminal, though in many instances he is a victim, but the later, or the latter, as a reformist or revolutionary, is interested in universal social change. Captured, he or she is a political prisoner. In this country, however, in the United States, where the special category of political prisoners is not officially acknowledged, the political prisoner inevitably stands trial for a specific criminal offense, not for a political act. In all instances, however, the political prisoner has violated the unwritten law which prohibits disturbances and upheavals and the status quo of exploitation and racism. So I think her quote really draws out right, like how our country has chosen to define political prisoners and also right like defines the what a political prisoner is and why they're so dangerous to this country or why they're viewed as so dangerous to those in power and the status quo. And the reason that I'm sharing that and why it feels so important is because of what Kojo mentioned at the beginning um, around the roots of Black August and what he will um, share more about now. And not, I would even say, right, that, like, to clarify, our country hasn't explicitly defined political prisoner on, um, you know, like, in a federal sense, in a state sense, in a legal sense, we don't recognize political prisoners like other more fascist slash totalitarian countries do. Um, regimes, I should say. So, like, the, you know, a major part of that distinction, as Julia said, you know, from the quote, is <clears throat> that whereas in another country, people will be explicitly rounded up for, like, thinking differently, for uh, dissenting, you know, from the status quo, in this country, because of the uh, values, right, the stated values of the Constitution, right, of the Declaration of Independence, we can't explicitly recognize a political prisoner class because, I mean, that's just like blatantly hypocritical. And, you know, this, 
the rule of law is all about not being blatantly hypocritical. You can be hypocritical, but, you know, like, dress it up. So we have political prisoners because there are people who have been in prison, such as uh, George Jackson, who I'm about to go into now, for, um, or rather, ke yeah, kept in prison, kept behind bars for their thoughts, for their writings, right, for organizing and things like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the state can't do that. So, like, what Angela Davis defines as a political prisoner in that context is someone who is rounded up under the pretext of criminal charges, right? It's the application of criminal charges to a case to remove, you know, agents from the communities and from the work that they're doing, right? That's what a political prisoner in the United States looks like. Uh, George Jackson is a really good example of um, one. He's a really interesting example of one. Um, this is going into the uh, kind of origins, the context behind the um, observation of Black August. Uh, George Jackson was one of the most prominent voices in the movement advocating for respect of the humanity and dignity of African people behind prison walls. Um, in the late 1960s through the 1970s, or, you know, early 1970s, because he was killed in prison. Um, and, you know, just a little bit about his case specifically to connect it to uh, the quote that Julia just made. George Jackson, he was, um, or that she just cited. <laughs> it's an Angela Davis quote. High praise. <laughs> um, George Jackson was imprisoned. He was in his teens, right? And I think he was um, accused of, he was charged with like armed robbery and stealing what amounted to $70 uh, from a gas station or something. And he was, his, he was sentenced to one year to life. It was something like that. And it's essentially the court saying, uh, you know, like when you demonstrate that you're rehabilitated or whatever, it will let you out of prison. But otherwise, we'll keep you in there until we think it's uh, appropriate to, uh, until we think it's inappropriate to keep you in there. Um, and <laughs> I mean, it's just a ridiculous sentence, right? Like, let that marinate. One year to life. Right. That is the state. And, you know, one of the things I'm going to get to in this is really like how ridiculous, how inane that concept is that you can. Right. Like, I don't know, teacher thing. Right. If I was if a student was acting up or they did some minor thing. Right. And I'm not saying like armed robbery is like super minor. But again, you know, as Julia said, you know, as Angela Davis said in that quote. Right. Um, there's a difference between. Anyway. I'm not going to get into all that. Point is, he was sentenced to one year to life, and then he went into prison, San Quentin, and became radicalized, right? And by radicalized, I mean politically aware. He came into his political consciousness in prison. And because of that, you know, he started writing. He's got uh, two of his major books, Soledad Brother, which is a collection of a lot of the essays he wrote, and Blood in My Eye, which is, um, I mean, it's dope. You, you should read both of those. We'll link them in the description. He started writing. He started communicating. He was corresponding with Angela Davis, you know, while um, she was in and outside of prison um, for, right? She's another example of a political prisoner. Um, and long story short, because he came into that awakening, that radical consciousness in prison, they kept him in prison, right? He was in prison for over 10 years for stealing, I mean, like, you know, armed robbery. But one, armed robbery, uh, I mean, there's a whole thing about prison, you know, and I think another interesting quote uh, from when we were doing that letter writing workshop, one of the guys who we were with, he was like, yeah, I'm a former political, former political prisoner. And um, one thing about political prisoners is, or prison abolition, rather, is if you believe in prison abolition, then everyone's a political prisoner. Everyone who's behind bars is a political prisoner. So that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Because, right, like, in what world is it fair for 
anyone to owe someone 10 years just for like pointing a gun at them and then taking $70, you know? I like I'm not condoning doing that, but I'm also definitely not condoning taking 10 years from them for doing such a thing. Mm-hmm. And are the the criminal legal system, right, provides that leniency. Right. And that's where it becomes really problematic, right? Cuz it's like one year to life or in the case of like a lot of and political people are still being arrested now as political prisoners, right? And they're right. still in prison now. And there's the leniency of it, so it can never be argued against, really, right? Like, the court system always has an argument to keep that person in prison because it works, prison works on behalf of the state. Right. Then I would say in that sense, um, I mean, I don't think the one-year-to-life sentence has been, um, I don't think it's still around. I think it's pretty antiquated. And, you know, getting into the... um, the 60s and 70s saw part of you know the black august awakening was the fact that that time period saw a lot of um reform right prison reform and i'm sure that was one of them uh instead we got you know mandatory minimums and you know three strikes right like back and forth which is part of that you know whole flexibility that you're talking about but i mean getting into it context 1960s saw an increase in the rights right afforded to people in the criminal justice system, such as the Miranda rights, etc. And the prison population nationally was around 300 or 400,000 inmates. And studies conducted, this is from uh, the New Jim Crow, studies conducted by federal agencies such as the FBI concluded toward the end of the decade, the 1960s, so in the late 1960s, that state or rather, that institutions such as federal and state prisons should be phased out as they both cost a lot of taxpayer dollars as well as performed more efficiently to produce criminals than they did to reduce criminals. So, you know, long story short, by the 1960s, late 1960s, early 1970s, conditions in prisons were recognized by the FBI and other federal agencies as being so bad that they produced more crime than they got rid of, right? Um, which is, you know, I think an interesting thing like to note that like when pri- the idea of prison came about, it in and of itself was a reform of the system of punitive uh, punition that existed before, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, that's one of the famous anecdotes is that prisons, as we know them in America, were created by Quakers to, cr- to reform and create a more humane way of uh, dealing with criminals, mm-hmm. which is, uh, and we see where it's gone now. Yeah, well, and I was just thinking George Jackson too, right? Like went in for armed robbery and then ultimately was killed for his role, right? right? And taking prison guard hostage and... Uh, well, no, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that at all. I think he was killed for his views. Well, yeah, but what I mean is like if the right, like his time in prison validates the statement that uh, prison yeah. right. actually enhances or increases, right, like what the state refers to as criminal activity. In a in a political prisoner sense, can you elaborate? Well, uh. I'm a assu- well, okay, so I don't know like the ins and outs of like what he was charged for, uh-huh. right? In his going into prison, no, and after he was in prison, right? Like his time in prison that's something that happens, I think, with a lot of people who enter the prison system, right? Then they can be charged, right? If there's a conflict with another inmate, if there's a conflict mm. with the prison guard, right. if they do all these other things, so then they like just start building up right. all of these charges. Because they're in a system that breeds violence that they otherwise, well, yes, that they otherwise would not necessarily have been inclined to engage in that way, right? Because, like, they don't have the freedoms anymore in that way. So in order to uh, live by their values, they have to take more drastic actions. Yeah. And, you know, I would take that further like to your point about leniency in the courts right that also applies once you know people are behind the prisons right because it's in the same way that crime what 
Amos Wilson calls it uh, quantifying the myth of criminality, right? Like the ways in which outside of prison, we, uh, not we, I don't do that shit. <laughs> but um, people, agencies, institutions, organizations manipulate the statistics, right? They manipulate, um, I mean, is yeah, they manipulate them. By saying, oh, look, like there's this many, you know, black people behind bars and there's this many white people behind bars. Like there's so many more black people behind bars that they're more criminal, right? Like it's clearly that's all the evidence you need. When the reality suggests that, you know, when all things are adjusted, um, when there's an equilibrium of uh, factors that you're looking at, crime rates are the same, right? Like black people aren't more criminal than white people. And really, you could make an argument <laughs> in the opposite direction. Um, I'm not going to go into that. So, like, the same thing happens in prison, right? Like, the guards, the COs, other inmates, you know, whatever groups, because that's a major thing that, you know, George Jackson brought light or brought to light is the fact is racism behind the prison bar, right? Bars. And the ways in which, like, white nationalist organizations behind prison or in prison um, depending on the prison, which I would say is most of them tend to have more power and more sway, more influence, um, when, you know, adjusted for population because of their relationship with, you know, the white, you know, COs and white warden, right? The white power structure. Um, so obviously they're going to be able to commit like a lot more crimes and get away with it and not have that stuff on their records and then get out of prison while like, you know, people who are literally defending themselves from that violence will get those strikes. Mm -hmm. Um, it's like prison is the most intense microcosm yeah. of society. Yeah. Probably like across, right? Like all social identities, I would imagine. Yeah. yeah. Of the worst of society. Right. That's, well, that's what I meant by intense. Yeah. 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 So, you know, like what I'm saying is I think as far as George Jackson's, I don't think George Jackson's specific case is the best example of like um, how prison breeds criminality in. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, mean, I, think I think there's the language part's important there. Yeah. To distinguish. Right. Um, but that's, you know, that's a little bit about George Jackson. Uh, you know, since we touched on it, he was, um, I mean, I would say there's reason to call it assassination. Um, the Soledad brothers, and, and, oh man, there's so much to get to, but like, <laughs> I'm just going to keep going. As we know, by the late 1960s, prisons were terrible places. I mean, you know, they still are, but they were, right, like the prisons that we know today are the product of... <laughs> reform and like f oversight, right? So just imagine how bad they were 50 years ago, 100 years ago. Going back, here's some context into like some cases that brought about like a substantive prison reform. 1949, the Eighth Amendment, which protects from cruel and unusual punishment was evoked for the first time in a case regarding prison treatment slash conditions. 1949, this was, um, then there was Chief Justice Warren opinion, the opinion, his court opinion on a 1958 Trop versus Dulles case, which you can look that up. I'm not going to get super into it, but his opinion was basically that the basic concept underlying the Eighth Amendment is nothing less than the dignity of man. The amendment must draw its meaning from the evolving standards of decency that mark the progress of a maturing society. So, you know, essentially what he's saying is that we can't, um, we have to play cruel and unusual by ear, right? What is cruel and unusual at the time? Another example of how the de facto treatment of black people and predominantly black men in this case in the U.S. South was literally unconstitutional for decades following Reconstruction with people being sentenced to serve inordinate uh, amounts of time, decades to life for violating petty and unconstitutional laws like casting an untoward glance or being out past curfew, right? So th the cruel and unusual thing was applied in 1958, again, really close to the 1960s, 1970s. And essentially what he was saying is like, you know, it's fucked up to go and like, right, these Jim Crow things, right? Like if you're out past curfew and then you're sentenced to 
10 years in prison. Or if you, you know, stick someone up and, you know, steal $70 and then you're sentenced to 10 years in prison. So it's, um, it casts court cases, it casts sentencing in the light of cruel and unusual punishment. Um, tellingly, you know, we would proceed to deviate far from this standard in criminal sentencing with the war on drugs, boom, which was over the horizon. The same disproportionate punishment of black people which characterized the Jim Crow South is recaptured in the war on drugs sentencing scheme, with severe sentences such as 25 to life being justified by mandatory minimums for certain classes of crime or by three strikes rules which mandates a uh, severe minimum sentence um, after three felony violations, regardless of the violent or nonviolent nature of the crime. Just particularly, like in stark contrast now, right, to marijuana being legalized and how that's being managed. And, you know, a lot of people consider the death penalty to be, to be cruel and unusual, but yeah. that still exists. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, like one of these things, right, the dialectic, the historical dialectic, history swings values and opinions swing back and forth. And I think this is a really good example of that, you know, because as we saw, like, again, before the civil rights era, uh, or I guess during, leading into the civil rights era with, you know, Brown versus Board was technically 1950s before the civil rights era, right? Everything that happened in the 60s was seeing its antecedents before the 60s, including the prison rights movement. So we see increased rights for prison movement, uh, for prison, increased momentum for prisoner rights, just like we see increased momentum for women's rights, increased momentum for the rights of people of color, you know, like all of that. And then like the 70s hit and we see this backlash, right, from the other side, right? The pendulum swings again and suddenly, right, we have all these crackdowns. So, you know, the same thing happened in prison. And it's just one of those really weird things that, you know, it's hard to imagine that we don't see it um, where, I mean, some of these hypocrisies. <coughs> Bless you. Thanks. Uh, just going to really quickly um, go into the legacy of George Jackson via one, two court cases. That happened in the 1970s. I believe George Jackson was uh, murdered, assassinated in 1972. Uh, I could be wrong about that. You should look it up. Um, so there's this one case, Ruiz versus Estelle, which is you know really interesting. It was a 1980, settled in 1980, and it came from a petition by a prisoner, David Ruiz in Texas, who in 1972, he was in the Texas correction system, alleging that the conditions of his confinement, overcrowding, poor access to health care, etc., were unconstitutional violations of the Eighth Amendment. So we see that coming back, uh, what was the math, 20-something years later. The decision in 1979, right, so it took a while to reach that decision, led to more federal oversight and an increase in prison construction going into the 1980s. Right, and I attribute that in part to George Jackson because, like I said, he was one of the most vocal advocates um, and publicized advocates for prisoners' rights. This petition was signed in, you know, uh, seventy-two or initiated in seventy-two. George Jackson had started doing his work in the late nineteen sixties. So there's, you know, plenty of reason to believe that this person would have been exposed to, if not George Jackson by name the fervor and the sentiment of, hey, you know, like we as prisoners not only deserve better rights, which would have been a kind of novel idea at the time, but also we have access to better rights, right? We're still um, Americans. So that was Trop versus Dulles, was it? Sorry, that was Ruiz versus Estelle. And then this is Gates versus Collier, which was settled in 72. And it was centered around the infamous Parchment Farms prison, which is worth looking into. I feel, I thought I wrote more down, and it's probably good that I didn't, because like, honestly, there's books that could be written about that place. It sounds terrible. But, you know, essentially, uh, Parchment Farms prison in Mississippi deemed certain forms of corporal punishment to be violations of the Eighth Amendment, and according to the ACLU, it was the first time a sweeping intervention into the supervision of prison practices had been mandated by the court. Just to clarify, 
the prison in Mississippi did not deem those forms of corporal punishment to be unconstitutional mm, or violations. No. They were practicing them. Right. And then the court. And then the Supreme case. Court. Yeah. Yeah. And they'd been practicing them for a long time. Um, <laughs> yeah. But of course. Yeah. I think the farm was, um, the prison was established in like 1906 or something. I'm sure it was a former plantation. It was. It was. I mean, it parked with farms. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and it's just what, yeah. I mean, like the particular specific conditions at that place were ridiculous. It was, there was a trustee system, which is one of the things that was deemed unconstitutional, which was essentially because there were so many inmates, most of whom were black, because again, it was Mississippi and, you know, put in there under like trumped up charges, Jim Crow, uh, violations, there were so many people, right? And um, part of the incentive of the uh, the warden who had sole exclusive oversight over the prison operations mm. was to save money, right? Like cut back on hiring people to monitor, to, to work at the prison. He got trustees to do it instead, right? He was like, I'm going to have the prisoners, prison, you know, police themselves. Um, so there was a whole hierarchy of, uh, prisoners who were responsible for different things, including armed prisoners, which mm -hmm. I think is one of those things. It's like, you know, you have, anyway, anyway. I mean, it, it's just striking to me, like how all of these things go together, right? I mean, that's like a callback to concentration camps. Right. Um, and Nazi Germany. Well, it's not even a callback. It, uh would have proceeded. <laughs> well, right, right, right. Yeah. What I mean is, right, like, and I'm not saying that that was the basis of the idea for it, right? Because, like, right. what we know about a lot of these things that have happened globally in the early 1900s and late 1800s, the U.S. was actually a model for, right? right. Like, eugenics and yeah. things. Um, but, yeah, it's really um, always kind of shocking to me how these things are all, like, parallel each other and how they're still continuing. Right, and that's one of the things about private prisons. I mean, if there's no federal oversight, even if there is federal oversight, right? I mean, like, people are always trying to cut costs. And the way, I mean, that ultimately harms the inmates even more. And then you think about cruel and unusual punishment and people being in solitary confinement. And we know, right, like, the psychological impacts of that. So mostly what I'm just trying to bring up is that all of these things are still happening right now. Um, and I do kind of want to circle us back around because I have a question, but are there other things? Um, I mean, I would just really encourage y'all to look up Parchman Farms, uh, because it's a really good example of, um, again, as bad as things are now, and I'm sure there are still places where things are, if not that bad, then approaching. There were a lot worse, right? Like, it's, again, one of those things people hear, oh, you know, Parchment Farms, and they're like, that's probably, you know, an exceptionally bad place, mm. right? But the reality is that it's just, that's where the court case happened, right? So that's mm -hmm. what we know about. This shit was happening all over the South, right? Mm -hmm. Because, again, it's a prison system that, I mean, society created second-class citizens, right? Especially Southern society with Jim Crow. And the black codes. So, I mean, these are the kind of systems you expect to flourish when you're dealing with second class citizens, right? Like, you know, like you said, with the concentration camps in Nazi Germany, like when you virtually explicitly deem a group of people less than human, you're going to treat them as such, you know, and this kind of, I could. I would go into the whole factory farming and like animal agriculture and, you know, how messed up that is. And, you know, like, I, you know, I'd be kind of interested in knowing like what the role of veganism in black August, you know, as far as observing the tenants are, because I feel like there is a lot of overlap there. Mm -hmm. You know, like we know that, you know, as far as Holocaust survivors, people who've been in those conditions not saying everyone, but there is a group, a significant group of people who've been in those conditions, been victimized by that kind of um, regime and can connect it to like, oh, okay, like people think it's okay. Like the same attitudes and sentiments that people 
put towards um, corralling chickens, right? Or corralling cows or corralling food animals into tight spaces and subhuman conditions on the premise that they are not human, people take that same idea and they apply it to other people who are humans, you know? But, yeah, and it's just one of those things, right? Like, that I think about, obviously, in my own practice, you know, like cockroaches, you know, all the things that I'm afraid of, right? Like spiders, you know, like flies, things that are inconvenient to things that like terrify you. You know, this is just my pontificating. Mm -hmm. But I would encourage people to uh, really like do some work around those things because it's true. Like the same feeling, visceral feelings of like fear or disgust or annoyance that we get at these things that prompt us to be like, oh, let's kill that fly or like exterminate these insects. Those same feelings that we have towards things that we can see as not human are the same feelings and essentially the same rationale that groups of people in other parts of the world apply to other people, right? Mm -hmm. Like what's going on in Burma, right? With the Rohingya, what, what's going on in uh, Israel, really, with the Palestinians, right? Like what was going on in apartheid Africa, what was going on here, what is going on here, you know, like... What's going on with the uh, the Uyghurs, you know, in China, mm. right? Ultimately, it all comes down to the capacity to say that is not like me, you know, and then focus on how different from you it is, right? And a lot of that stuff is institutionalized, it's indoctrinated, it's socialized. We're socialized into those systems, into those patterns of thought, but. Um, I do think that in the West, the earliest forms of that tend to be with, right? It's in the same way, very similar to how like signs of sociopathy or like anti, oh, what is it? Anti-social personality behavior, which manifest harmfully towards other people. You see them first manifesting, you know, against animals, mm -hmm. right? So uh, veganism all the way, Black August. Go ahead. What was your name? Thanks for looking at me with the antisocial behavior. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, that's, you know, I hadn't thought about, Kojo and I have been having an ongoing conversation about how to manage the cockroaches that appear in our um, home. <laughs> and I've never thought about the way, like the visceral reaction I have to cockroaches. And now we've moved far away from killing them. Uh, so that feels like a huge win for me. I still don't want to share a home with them. Um, but I've never considered like the visceral reaction I have to them. Uh, that some people experience that with other people. Yeah. And I mean that hits me pretty deep. So I will be like processing that. And not in the way that I will want to share a home with cockroaches probably. Um, due to some you know like sanitary things and not wanting them in my food hmm. um but in a way to better understand you know like my own discomfort and fear with them and I mean it's like it's heart-wrenching that other people would feel that way about other people yeah um I I do want to, I do have a question um, that I think will kind of like bring us back around. So I feel like we've kind of gone off into different yet all related topics around Black August. And Black August is observed in August for some of the reasons that Kojo mentioned, um, that there are a lot of notable um, events that happened um, in August. And so I would encourage you to look some of those things up. Like I think... Um, you know, like some rebellions, revolutions, um, death days, um, birthdays. birthdays. So I would definitely encourage you to check a lot of those um, things out and look more into that. And one of the questions that I have, like kind of bringing us back around to the tenants and observations, is a lot of the tenants are rooted in um, discipline and learning. And I'm curious, you know, kind of given some of the context and what we've talked about and what we know about um, stereotyping of African-American and black folks in the United States. Um, 
and kind of some of the like what feel like similarities between Black August and um, Ramadan in terms of fasting or um, and you know like growing closer to faith and knowledge and practice. I'm curious like what you make of the um, like really strong disciplinary undertones of the tenants in terms of education, like avoiding mind altering substances. Some places call for like abstaining from sex, like abstaining from spending money at certain places, from television, right? Like from all of these kind of like, uh, I don't know, like, yeah. And ways to like fill time or like to experience immediate pleasure. Yeah. Um, I mean, part of it I would say is probably, I mean, there's, good reason to believe that it was influenced like you said you know by uh, religious modes of observing uh, certain time periods right like uh, the nation of Islam in the 1960s its numbers had really risen and you know it's safe to say that you know insofar as the political prisoner population went up because that's another thing, right? In the 1960s, right, it's not really a coincidence that people behind bars just happened to be like, oh, you know, we deserve rights too. It's that like that time period saw an unprecedented number of people who weren't just put behind bars because um, they disagreed with society or something. Or, right, because they'd committed a crime, right? Because they'd broken a law in pursuit of, you know, like, self-interest or whatever. But an unprecedented increase in the number of people who went into jails and who ultimately went into prisons for um, violating the social norms, right? In pursuit of collective justice. Think of the King Movement, right? And all the people, all the protesters who were imprisoned for, right? Even King himself for... uh, standing up against the white power structure (laughs) or, you know, so people thought because we see where we are now. Um, But yeah, I mean like not knocking King, he was in the right place in the late 1960s. Um, Right. So there was an influx of people who were uh, radically minded, revolutionary lead minded going into prisons, right. Going into jails. And that stuff also helped. So I just want to draw that connection, right? It's not coincidence. It's a, uh, it's part of the ecology of revolution, um, right? And that includes members of the Nation of Islam. They were targeted, as we know, Malcolm X himself, El Haj Shabazz, was um, assassinated. But you know, it stands to reason that other members of NOI were imprisoned at the time and you know I know I don't know if you know this but like the Muslim population uh, I mean black Muslims in prisons today have they make up a significant ideological and like demographic uh, component of uh, the inmate population so I think that connection is there and I mean, to your question, I guess one of the other questions would be, why is it that the Nation of Islam is so disciplined in its uh, proceedings as well, right? Because, right, yeah, because yeah. they don't need to be. And, you know, a lot of people would be like, oh, you know, it's because Islam itself is a very strict, very rigid disciplinary structure or culture, which, I mean, yeah, you can make that argument. But um, what I would say to your question is you know understanding how black august how intentional right these revolutionaries are how deliberate they are like i don't think they would just go and say okay we can copy this structure from the nation of islam um for the sake of right copying a religion like it seems to be working for them i think as far as the emphasis on discipline the operative um incentive is that that's what it takes mm. to sh- struggle effectively, you know. Mm. Like if you're abstaining from mind-altering substances, it's you know a recognition that society has altered our minds enough, you know, yeah. and that we don't need you know to fuck around with drugs or you know alcohol, right? If we're also abstaining, right? Because again, this was late nineteen 
70s when Black August first came into observation. So it was before the war on drugs, right? But we also have to recognize today that um, if we're abstaining from mind-altering substances, it's because those same substances that we would likely be partaking in have destroyed our communities, right? Like alcohol at the time was a major um, recourse for, I would say, black men specifically. Because by the 1970s, you know, jobs had already started pulling out of the inner city. And, you know, you have a bunch of unemployed, you know, African people in America who are now resorting to drinking alcohol, right? And doing whatever drugs they can um, in order to, like, pass the time or, you know, to numb whatever pain. If we're, you know, abstaining from sex, you know, like, I mean, it's in prison. <laughs> so, like, that's one thing to keep in mind as well is that uh, I wonder, like, to what extent these tenants were formed by people who were currently incarcerated or at the time or formerly incarcerated. Um, and then just also recognizing that, like, you know, what kind of, um, if the struggle involves being for women, right? If it involves specifically uplifting black women, right? Then what kind of patriarchal, you know, toxically masculine practices were in place that people uh, would have been engaging in, right? Specifically men, black men, to go out and like have sex with women, right? Like how do you create something that says, uh, or rather how do you facilitate an order that mandates doing that in a, in a way that's respectful, right? To the dignity of women, right? And stuff like that. Not to say that women wouldn't also be observing these practices. Um, I would say in that case, it's, it's the same situation, right? Like, uh, anyway, I'm not gonna get into all that. But, you know, I think ultimately that's it, right? Like everything that you're abstaining from, if you're abstaining from, you know, buying things that you don't need, right? You're abstaining from the capitalist consumer culture, right? Which we know is the underpinning of this whole system of exploitation. Everything that we're abstaining from, uh, or rather, there is a need to abstain from as much as possible because mm -hmm. literally every facet of society is tainted, you know, with the, the legacy of the white power structure into the present, right? So by abstaining from as much as possible and focusing on the studies, focusing on the reflection and the observation, focusing on building a path forward to struggle, mm -hmm. you're minimizing the, um, the number of inputs which can actively impede or reverse your progress. Yeah, I mean, I think what you said is so important about um, like engaging in these practices brings you closer to the struggle with which we need to engage in to um, like participate in the liberation right of everyone right. and that if we are um, like if we don't have those experiences or we're not we're only working for certain um, groups or certain individuals or people who are experiencing right like certain struggles that we're not actually um, like what actually I guess are we working for and that it's a demonstration of um, commitment and true engagement to um, like really um, gain a deeper understanding and um, like engage in the, the liberation process. If you're removing yourself from um, or limiting your interaction with the oppressive societal structures, which all of these tenants call for right. that ultimately right like benefit uh the power structure yeah and you know one of the other things about that <clears throat> is you know earlier you mentioned right the um idea of studying study groups mm -hmm. um and i would add to that and say that not only is it good for accountability and for uh, deepening one's understanding of the subject material which I thought was really interesting that that's what you pulled out of it. 
because I think the more crucial element of that is again collectivization, right? Mm-hmm. Because insofar as all of these tenants are oriented towards resisting the status quo, we have to also recognize that one major part of the status quo is this individualization, this atomization, right? Super atomization of social units to the point where the individual consciousness is the fundamental unit versus Mm -hmm. like a group of people being that fundamental unit or the bonds, anyway. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, yeah, building those study groups does have the benefits as you mentioned, but Mm -hmm. it also facilitates social cohesion which can be leveraged to, um, I mean, again, just in the name of progress. You know, mm-hmm. groups of people bring about progress, mm-hmm. sustainable and lasting progress, yeah. not individuals. You're absolutely right. I'm glad that you um, brought that back around because I think, I mean, that piece is so important, right? And like when you think about. You know, it also reminds me, like, when we talked about, like, why more people don't know about Black August and why do we celebrate Black History Month, right? Because Black History Month is a whitewashed celebration of individual achievements that um, don't go against, right, like the status quo. Whereas, yeah, Black August, right, if there was an actual um, recognition, like a mainstream recognition of it, um, I mean, there's a whole like linguistic thing to be sorted out there, but <laughs> right, like it would be a serious threat. Well, because of well, yeah, I think that's an interesting question as well. Is um, I mean, we know right that the system is self-adaptive, um, and as much as I would like to think that it would be a threat, right? If like. People, I mean, if people observe the tenants, if people are studying the right, right material and they're studying right, that would make sense, right? Yes, that's what I meant. The the ideal right. of holding on to the tenants and the very unideal yeah. <laughs> world. Yeah. But then, you know, you think about black history and like what was the uh, what was the incentive there? What was the ideal? Because Juneteenth, I think, it makes complete sense to say that that was always destined to be a mainstream you know, celebration that poses no threat to the status quo because the events of it itself were not drastically, you know, looking back, uh, uh, they didn't shift the status quo that much, right? Like, yes, slavery is abolished on paper, but also, you know, Jim Crow is put on paper and the black codes are put on paper. And then, you know, like chain gangs and, you know, uh, convict lease programs are put on paper. So all of that does effectively re-enslave the population. Black History Month came about um, with like the well-meaning intention of having per, uh, compelling people. <laughs> it's the to, liberal media that Black August requires you to abstain from. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, yeah. So... Yeah, I think that, that is a really interesting question of the mainstream. I, I think I'm thinking about the Matrix. <laughs> and like, but you of know, course. Yeah. yeah. This idea that Zion in the Matrix is part of the Matrix, right? And it was a layer created by the machines to deal with people who had woken up um, without letting them know that they've woken up. I'm not saying that that's a theory. I think it's actually been uh, debunked by the creators, but it's interesting to think about, right? Because how would we know, right? Maybe the creators don't know because the machines have their control anyway. So like, you know, as far, I do think it's a really crucial question to prepare for, or rather to anticipate, or a crucial outcome to anticipate and prepare for, right? Because what would the system, what would the status quo need from people in order to essentially nullify Black August? And, right, so this goes back to what you said at the very beginning, right, is carrying those principles forward. I think that's a major uh, thing, right, because the status quo, the system, the powers, that, the white power structure, all they would really need is for people to say, oh, it's Black August, let me hunker down and study now, 
and then not do that for the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. right? Just like Black History Month. The idea behind Black History Month was to say, hey, you know, we have really it started as uh, a week or two weeks, and then it went to a, uh, you know, a few days, like some decades later. And the point was to say, hey, look, you know, these are all our contributions. This is how much we contribute to the American landscape and have contributed to the American landscape. We're just as American as everyone else. And it was a bit integrationist, but it was like, hey, you know, like, let's learn about our history. I do wonder what role Africa played in that history, because uh, as far as I know, at the time, it didn't play a huge role. Right? I think it was like Carter G. Woodson in the 1920s, 1930s, and, um, you know, so that... There was a Garvey influence, but there wasn't really the um, Afro-historical influence that came about in the 1950s, 1960s. Again, in that same era, that was there was a global, right? It was the post-World War II era. So there, And we got into Vietnam, some stupid shit. But like, there was a lot going on in the 1960s, not just here in the States, but all over the world, right? So, but, you know, the, again, the point is... Black History Month should be just like that jumping off point to say, hey, this matters all year round, and then not just recognize that it matters. Right. Of continued learning. Yeah. But instead, it's like, it's the uh, locus, right? It, it doesn't go anywhere beyond February. And what happens in February is so superficial, again, as to highlight tokenism rather than um, acknowledge the actual conditions, right? What would you say about, you know, I know we have this ongoing discussion of Pan-Africanism and whether or not you could be a Pan-Africanist and, you know, what that all means, which I think is a really important question to ask. As far as Black August is concerned mm -hmm. and the tenets and the objective of Black August, um, what would you say to, like, other white people about that? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say something that I've learned recently um, through some of my communications with a political prisoner are that, or I guess like the main thing is um, that uh, similar to what I said before around, right, like understanding the struggle and being together in the struggle is what ties us together. Right, so in following these tenets, I think for white people in particular, brings us to a closer understanding of the struggle and of what is needed in terms of revolution and overhauling the system and of what we can do to participate in the destruction of a system that our ancestors created and that we benefit from because we will never be free right until everyone with us is free and not in a way right i mean it brings me back to one of my favorite quotes about like if you have come to free me like you're wasting your time but if you have come to participate right in the liberation struggle with me then um, we can all do this together. If you've come to struggle because you see that your liberation is bound up in mine. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, that's what I would say, right? Like if people, you know, like for every, for all white people out there who have been putting up Black Lives Matter signs and going to protests or posting that Black Lives Matter or, you know, doing something like that, think further ahead think more deeply right like think about how your liberation is bound up in that of others and how um and what you can do to really more deeply understand and participate um or be in that struggle with other people and i think these tenants would help folks would help white folks in particular to get there and to understand that um and would be a much more effective uh, engagement than posting a Black Lives Matter hashtag or something on social media. One thing that I do want to add to that is just this idea that um, white people benefit from, so like that phraseology of like, you know, a system that we benefit from. I think it definitely 
right? White people only benefit or can only conceive of the benefits of the system because the costs of participating in that system are not as clear to white people. So I think that's one of, that's, you know, the only thing that I'm going to add. Yeah, thanks for asking that question. Hopefully, um, we'll have the opportunity to come back and talk more about that because I think it's, uh, you know, obviously it's really important. Yeah. Um, and thanks, you know, for that response because I think that's, uh, I mean, that is the key, right? Like, one struggle, common struggle, one love. And the sooner we all realize that, the more easily, right? will be able to achieve the goals of that struggle, achieve the ends of that struggle, as well as resist the divisive forces that exist to preserve the status quo. Right, yeah, absolutely. Or you. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we're going to wrap up there for today's episode. Thanks for joining us. We'll link um, George Jackson's books that you mentioned in the description and maybe a couple other things. And as we've mentioned before, you know, do some more research um, into Black August. And don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks, Brandon, for commenting on our last one. Shout out. We saw you. We'll work on getting better at responding to comments. (laughs) Yeah. I was like, a week week ago. (laughs) Oops. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, look up Black August, but also, you know, don't get so caught up in the Black August part right Right. it's september and we're still doing you know black august stuff so because right black august is inside that's you know part of the discipline is you have to have the discipline to not just do black august in august right everything that black august means in august it means throughout the entire year look up the people look up the events look up the history And, you know, most importantly, Black August is about prisoners and prison reform. So make sure that is the stuff. That's the subject. We'll go ahead and link a few books, right? Because Angela Davis has written a lot of great, um, she's got a lot of great literature Mm -hmm. on the subject. Obviously, George Jackson, who we said we'd link. Mm -hmm. Michelle Alexander, The New Jim Crow. Um, Yeah, and there's a few others, too. And probably people you haven't heard of because activists aren't celebrities, nor should they be. It becomes problematic when they are. Yeah. Um, so we'll share those as well. Right. And That's... we will sign off for now. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>